Hello everybody and welcome to this presentation on Flexcom 8.10. Uh, my name is Angus Connolly and I am the product manager for our Flexcom software. So Flexcom 8.10 was released uh, recently just uh, in August 2018 and in today's presentation I'm going to walk you through uh, some of the new features which we've introduced in this latest version of Flexcom. So in terms of an agenda, um, I'm going to cover some of the high level uh, larger technical features first and then gradually move into more of the smaller miscellaneous features as we move down through the presentation. So I'll start by speaking about um, metal plasticity, which is a, a very new and very innovative feature in Flexcom 8.10. So in terms of some of the applications for metal plasticity, in terms of uh, insulation of, a, of steel pipes, uh, particularly over s SLA stingers, we can see some plastic deformation in the overbend region due to the the, the, the large water depths involved the, with the self weight of the pipe and, and the, the radius of curvature of the stinger. Also for relay operations where you've got um, some pipe reeled around a drum, it obviously encounters some plastic deformation while on the drum and then it needs to be uh, passed through a straightening device subsequently to remove some of that deformation. Um, perhaps drilling risers, if a drill ship were to exceed the safe limits of its operating circle, uh, then you could see some plastic deformation uh, in components down near the wellhead, but that would be very, um, very, very highly unusual and something would be more of a what if scenario rather than something that you would actually design for, obviously. So, in terms of an example to illustrate um, plasticity, I'll just switch back over to Flexcom here for a moment. Um, if you go to Flexcom example projects, um, there is a see where is my uh sorry it's, excuse me it's, it's in the installation so it's h uh, 5 steel pipe installation with plastic deformation um and i'll probably just actually go to a video first of all to to illustrate that more easily go to my video folder bear with me for a moment apologies so hopefully you can see my my uh example on screen here we, we have um, an installation of a steel pipe over an SLA stinger at deep water depths. And you can see maybe just at the lower end of the pipe, which is just coming down off the, sea, off the stinger, there has been some residual strain built up in the overbend region as that passes over the stinger. And that persists while the pipe is being passed down to the seabed. So as we play the animation on further, again, you can see there's an area here which, you know, it's not forming a natural catenary. And obviously here as well. So the the path dependent nature of, of plastic deformation is captured in this Flexcom model. And that's in example H05, as I mentioned there, if you want to have a look at the example yourself and see all the keyword inputs and so on. So I'll just gradually walk you through some more of the detail here in terms of the underlying theory for, for plasticity in Flexcom. Um, if you look at the figure on the right there, the B, what you can see is there's initially, if you look at a stress strain um, curve, there's initially a straight region uh, with a constant uh, value, or linear value of Jung's modulus. And um, once you pass the yield point, then you get plastic deformation. So what we do in Flexcom is um, when you, def you, you define a, a, a linear value of Jung's modulus, and then you also define a plastic stress versus plastic strain relationship in your Flexcom input file. Um, if the direction of um, bending is reversed, then you come back down on the, the secondary uh, line here, which is shown on the, on the right of the figure. And we due to plastic hardening on the after the, the moment reversal, then it takes um, an additional stress to actually drive the, the structure into, into the plastic region again, beyond once it's reached its initial yield point. So we call this model nonlinear isotropic hardening in Flexcom. There are a number of uh, plasticity models uh, available in theory, and this is the one we've selected for Flexcom. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So the yield surface um, in, increases in, in size, it continually expands due to the, the plastic hardening effect. So every time we bend the structure and rebend it in the, in the opposite direction, then the yield surface starts getting larger and larger. So we need further and further stresses to actually induce plasticity after uh, in the initial yield point. 
In terms of how we solve for that in FlexCom, we use what's called a predictor corrector method. You don't need to worry too much about this. It just means that uh, on, on our initial solution, our first pass, we assume that all the deformations are elastic. And then uh, after yielding, we can extract the plastic deformations and then subsequently correct uh, for the elastic deformations. And this happens iteratively as the solution progresses. If you'd like any further um, information in terms of the theory behind plasticity, you can just go to the online help um, for FlexCom and go to theory, uh, model building, uh, geometric properties, uh, geometric properties, rigid visor format, and then there is a section in here on uh, linear elastic um, material behavior with, with plastic hardening effects. Okay, so you, I'll, I'll let you browse that information in your own time if you, if you if you do feel like that you need to do so. Let me switch back to the presentation. Um, so in FlexCom we have a beam element, as you recall, which is a, just a, a single element with two endpoints. So we don't have a, a pipe element, which is shown on the right-hand side of the screen there, where you would have, as well as having integration points along the length of the element, you would have integration points around the the circumference and through the cross section, through the wall thickness. So we, we don't have that in FlexCom. So what we have done is we have um, modeled the plastic deformation in, in so far as we can with our own element. So the approach we've adopted is that in terms of torsion, we just assume that the torque as you twist a pipe, that it's linear elastic behavior. So we have a linear GJ term, which is derived from a constant value of the shear modulus that you would input as a user. In terms of the axial behavior, um, because we have this stress-strain curve, which is comprised of um, a linear region for uh, the, the constant value of humans modulus and then the plastic stress versus plastic strain, we simply uh, convert that from stress-strain into force, uh, axial force, axial strain. That defines the axial characteristics. Then in terms of the bending across the the bending properties of the pipe, we integrate the stress-strain curve across the local cross-section. And then depending on the value of the local effective tension in the pipe, we can reintegrate that um, stress strain curve to come up with updated properties as a function of time. And you have some control over that as a user. In terms of validation of our new plasticity model, we looked at a number of different test cases as of increasing complexity. First thing we did was we looked at the cantilever beam where we subjected to bending and axial loading uh, either monotonically increasing or cyclic or periodic loading. We got excellent agreement with a beam element in Abacus, as we would expect, because the Plexcom's beam element and the beam element in Abacus would be very, very similar. And we also got very good agreement with the pipe element in Abacus. So uh, the figure on the right there would show a schematic of what a pipe element might look like. We did see some slight deviations between Plexcom and Abacus, particularly for um, high large number of, of cyclic uh, cyclic load cases and that's purely due to the fact that abacus can accurately predict uh, plasticity effects which change across the wall thickness so in flexcon because we just have a beam element once we bend that beam element to a certain point and it yields we assume that, that yielding occurs instantaneously right across the wall thickness but for the types of pipes we're looking at they're generally they're relatively large diameter with a relatively thin wall so it's not an unreasonable assumption to assume that the plasticity happens right across the wall thickness at the same instant in time in reality obviously there's a time lag because the further away from the neutral axis that you are um, the plasticity will will develop more more quickly rather than on the inner surface and so on but for the further purpose of validation we were um, quite satisfied with our comparisons with with abacus and if you'd like some more detail on that we can provide you with a, a validation report which we're happy to, to to share by email if you're interested so that covers plasticity which as i said is, is a very very powerful feature in flexcom on, on which i hope you'll you'll get some some use out of the next thing i wanted to, to speak about was a user defined element in flexcom so traditionally in FlexCom, you define the properties of an element um, before you perform a simulation. And then throughout the, the simulation as a function of time, uh, you know, those properties are, are, are hardwired. You've built the model, it remains consistent throughout. With this user-defined element in FlexCom, we've increased and we've opened the door to much more modeling flexibility from a user perspective because you can actually modify any of the element properties while the simulation is in progress. So Maybe let me just throw up a little video to um, illustrate what you could do with this. 
this is an example of a, a lazy uh, wave system with a midwater arch and here I've simulated failure of these buoyancy tanks as a function of time by reducing the buoyancy diameter uh, while the simulation is in progress. So that's obviously not something you'd want to model in reality, you know, because that's that wouldn't really happen. But it just goes to show you the power and flexibility of this new user-defined element feature. Um, I have another more simple example here as well. It's a recovery of an object from a seabed where I increased the buoyancy diameter of some elements in order to generate some uplift. And then I've plotted the trajectory of that object uh, as we lift up through the water column. Again, that's very easy to do by um, writing a subroutine, uh, which controls the properties of those elements as a function of time. So perhaps I will um, switch over to show you some, some source code. So there is this new, I'll go back to Flexcom first of all. So if you go to help example projects, um, specialized examples, so there's J1, there's an, an example here called a dropped object which is exactly what it is. It's, it's an object which is held over the held over the water source and allowed to fall through the water column. But what we've added is, we've added a new uh, simulation here called recovery. Uh, let me just hide this window, make this a little bit bigger. So there's just, it's a very simple keyword. The keyword itself is just star user defined element and then you just uh, specify a path to a DLL. So let's have a quick look at what that DLL might look like. Um, and I'll just open up my, I have an Intel Visual Fortran compiler on my computer, but if you don't have access to one of these, there are a number of uh, free compilers available online. So this is what the subroutine looks like, a uh, subroutine user defined element, and there are a large amount of uh, what we call arguments or, or data, which is passed in and out of the subroutine. But many of these are you know, their names are very self-explanatory. You can see that's axial force, this is, you know, shear and z direction, torsion, bending, and so on. These are output variables from Flexcom. We also have um, input variables or, or, or variables which control the properties of the model. For example, the element lengths, the element bending stiffness, torsional stiffness, axial stiffness, element mass, per unit length, and the various element diameters, and so on. So as you read down through this subroutine, um, everything is really well defined. So it, it it tells you what the variable types are, are the integers or, or real numbers and so on. And, if, and it also tells you the dimensions because many of these are, are arrays rather than, than scalar values. And let, let's just kind of scroll down a little bit further. It's very well commented so you know what all the variables mean because there's a table here, a legend that tells you exactly what each variable is. So for example, it's effective tension in the elements at the previous time step is, is stored in this array called EFF underscore tension. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we look at the actual code itself, and let me just maybe briefly switch back to the presentation so you'll see what I'm actually doing. Um, there's a series of elements here, which I'm representing as, as a balloon, which, which are initially a very, very small buoyancy diameter. And then as a function of time, I'm increasing those elements in terms of their buoyancy diameter to create an uplift. So if I switch back to my um, my code, so the vast majority of this subroutine is just a template. And really when you want to insert your own code, it's just uh, you insert a little bit of code or however much code you need down below at the bottom of the subroutine. In my case, what I'm doing is I'm looping over all the, number, the elements in the model. I am searching for elements which have a certain number. So I know the numbers of these, what I'll continue to call balloon elements in the model. They happen to be 853, 854, and so on. Um, and then what I'm doing is I'm setting the buoyancy diameter of those elements to be a certain value. And that certain value I'm scaling up as a function of time, as a function of the, the, the simulation time. So although we can't see it on screen um, here, the elements are actually growing in size physically, and that's what creates the uplift. So it's it's a very, very powerful feature, um, and how you choose to use it will be very much dependent on the applications that you wish to study yourself. Um, so I'd encourage you to have a go at it and see how, how it pans out for you. And if you have any questions, you can contact our, our uh, technical support helpline. So as, as well as just being able to mo um, modify the properties of the elements themselves, you also have access to 
all of the solution variables in FlexCon. So for example, if you wanted to simulate a mooring line failure, you could armed with a knowledge of what the tension is in the, in the mooring line as a function of time in every element in that line, you could monitor that and for example, if the tension exceeded a, a, a certain critical value, then you could um, reset, say, the axial stiffness of one of those mooring line elements to zero or very close to zero, and it will simulate an actual breakage or, or a snapping of the, of the mooring line. So there, there are many, many, um, many potential applications of this. It really opens up the door uh, to, to, to much more um, innovative use of FlexCon by our user community and we'd be we'd be delighted to hear if you have any feedback on the feature please let us know um, so the, those two features the plasticity and the user defined element are highly technical features um, the one I'm going to speak about now is what's called the unity plugin which is very much a, a visual feature or, or a, a cosmetic or a, uh, you know a, a, a user a usability feature if you like to call it like that so what I showed you there in the previous um, models, uh, maybe just pop open this one again. So you'll see that this type of animation comes from FlexCom, and while it looks it looks okay visually, it's not incredibly visually um, detailed. It's not a very high resolution video. So what we have done with FlexCom is we've developed what's called a plugin to another software called Unity. And uh, Unity is a gaming engine basically for video game developers. I'll just kind of, I'll just kill the sound on that there so you can, you can just watch the video. So what you can actually do is you can create very, very realistic sort of almost photorealistic videos which can be played either on screen as a, as a, as a movie or you can actually put on a headset and experience them in this virtual reality environment. So that's just a, a little clip of me experiencing um, a midwater arch model. So you, you can actually move and pan around these models using these flight controllers as well in your hand. Uh, so with a little bit of scale in terms of uh, video creation, you can create some very, very detailed models uh, from FlexCom now. So I'll just, uh, I'll just kill that video. Um, so why would you want to do this? Because uh, two, two, two main reasons. The first reason would be just in terms of promotion. So if you have a very innovative uh, engineering design or, or product or service that you wish to uh, promote to your customers you can create some very very high definition videos um, you can also you know display this stuff at a, at a stand at a trade show if you have a vr kit the vr kits are um are quite relatively inexpensive nowadays because they're becoming more more popular in terms of technology it's more readily available in terms of an engineering design then when you're actually in this VR space itself, it gives it does give you a very good sense of scale and perspective, um, and and real time real time real space between different objects in in a three D environment. So you may wish to examine, for example, uh, clearances between different components and, and see just physically what that feels like in that space. If you'd like to try um, the VR yourself, let me just double click on this link. So if you don't have a, if you don't have this VR kit, which is like a proper headset, what you can do is we've just popped up um, two videos for you on uh, YouTube. And if you were to get a Google Cardboard um, headset, or even just hold up your your um, your mobile phone sort of directly, to, 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 you know, these are like 3D panoramic videos where you can actually, if you hold up your mobile phone put it into this um, Google Cardboard mode of playing, you can actually just twist your head around, up and down, and feel like you're in the VR space. So it's like a, a, a sort of a cheap fabrication of um, what you could see in the proper 3D headset. So that's available there in our in our uh, online help. So if you go to Flexcom, user interface, results examination, Unity, there's an interactive demonstration there, which means you don't actually need all these fancy headsets. You can actually just try it out yourself if you want. We've also built a tutorial video, which I won't go into now, but um, in order to create these 3D videos in Unity, uh, you would need some basic skill in terms of um, working with that software package. So Unity is a third party software package. It's separate from Flexcom. You'd have to purchase it and license it separately from Flexcom. But if you didn't want to do that, go to that trouble or you didn't necessarily have 
uh, engineers with some graphic design skills, you could ask Wood for our company to do this as a service for you, which we'd be more than happy to do so. But this would obviously come as an additional cost. It wouldn't be covered by your normal FlexCam license. So just to give you an example of how um, broad the applications are, we've we've looked at stuff as diverse as, as a wave energy converter and a nuclear power plant, and we've created um, visual simulation, visual representations of these environments in a VR head space, and have successfully delivered scopes of work like that to various customers. Okay, uh, that's that's uh, hopefully you've got the idea of of, of Unity. Um, let me now just speak to you about the hydrodynamic data importer. So if you go to in fact, come 8.10 tools, model building, hydrodynamic data importer. This is a really useful tool which lets you import data from uh, radiation diffraction codes. So hydrodynamic uh, simulation codes like WAMIT, ANSYS Aqua, uh, NEMO. You can just browse for uh, an output file from WAMIT. Once you find it, just say OK. Um, and then you just define an output folder somewhere on your hard drive where you want to st uh, store um, results from let's say WAMIT in a format which is acceptable to FlexCon. When you've got all that done, you just hit the run button. So what this does is when you perform a radiation diffraction or a potential flow simulation uh, of, of any object, it could be like a, an FPSO or a CAM boy or, or a, you know, a, a wave energy converter or so on, WAMIT and, and packages like WAMIT will give you uh, force REOs as a function of wave frequency and wave heading. It will also give you added mass and radiation damping as a function of frequency. And in the past, it would have been a little bit more difficult to transfer this data into FlexCon because you'd have to actually check what all the conventions are and say, WAMIT, you know, are the phase angles in degrees or radians? Is it is a phase angle, phase angle convention lagging or leading and so on? So now, the hydrodynamic data importer does all of this stuff for you, and it's a really, really useful for uh, useful package, it's like a utility tool which accompanies FlexCon. Um, I think it's it's fairly self-explanatory. If you need to use it, it's it's you know it's it's, it's really easy. Um, it takes away a lot of the user effort which would be otherwise be involved. Uh, that's the hydrodynamic data importer. If you need any more information on it, again, you just go to the online help, uh, which I'll say here. Um, Model. So it's FlexCom user interface model building hydrodynamic data importer. And let's say, you know, using the importer is just basically what I've so told you there. And it goes into more detail in terms of what files are generated in terms of force REOs, added mass, and so on. You can even go into more detail in terms of what data it extracts from WAMIT and how it converts that over to FlexCom. So again, you can browse as, as, you, as you see, as you wish there. Okay, back to my uh, presentation, my slideshow. Uh, this next feature is called Summary Wave Scatter, which is a really useful feature for um, time uh, runtime efficiencies. So on the right-hand side of the screen here, I have a wave scatter diagram, which would uh, characterize um, sea state conditions uh, for some geographical location. So we plot wave height, significant wave height, HS, on the, on the vertical there, versus wave period, uh, in seconds on the horizontal. So if you look at all those different cells there, these are percentages of occurrences uh, of, of these particular sea state combinations in, in the in the grander scheme of things over, you know, this could be a 10 year or 100 year return period. Um, so if you were to simulate this in FlexCom, you'd need to do a, for every cell here, which has a non-zero value contained in it. So let's say it could be a 10.5 second period with a 2.75 meters wave height. You would set that up with, let's say, a Pearson Moskowitz spectrum. <coughs> Excuse me. Pearson Moskowitz or John Swap or some random spectrum. And you would probably run a three hour simulation, uh, 10,000 seconds uh, for that particular load case. There are probably 50 or 60 different cells there. So you'd have 50 or 60 different load cases to run, each of which might run for three hours. So, for computational efficiency reasons, you may not wish to simulate all of those sea states explicitly. What you could do in FlexCom nowadays is to um, group similar sea states into blocks. So what I've done there is using these red markers, I have um, selected columns basically. So what I'm what I'm saying there is 
all of the sea states which have a period of 10.5 seconds, for example, are grouped together in one single block. Within that block, then, I've nominated this uh, one particular sea state, which is 2.75 meters, as the reference sea state for that block. That's the one with the little red tick mark in the top right-hand corner of the box there. So what I would do then is I would run a three-hour random simulation for a time domain simulation for that particular sea state, and then for all the other sea states in that column or in that block, I will just simply estimate what the results are based on a extrapolation technique. So it's it's somewhat crude and somewhat simplistic, but if you're at a feasibility or a, a preliminary or concept design stage, it allows you to do a, a very very large amount of simulations very very quickly. Um, so. What it does is it actually creates a summary database file uh, for the, the cells which you haven't specific, which you haven't actually modeled explicitly in terms of FlexCom simulation, and then you can use a summary collation feature to pull all that data together. Just one word of caution: I would say that this would only be used for screening studies. It's not to be used, certainly not to be used for any detailed engineering design. If you'd like to see um, how this might be used, um, let me just throw up some FlexCom. <coughs> Excuse me. I just throw open. So I got a, a bit of a cough the last couple of days. I'll just throw open one of the um, Flexcom models, which might allow you to see this. So there's a project, uh, one of the projects out here, the Wave Energy project, which has got some random C simulation in it. Here I would have performed quite a number of simulations. Let me just hide these keywords. So. I've performed about uh, well about sort of ten or twelve simulations there from the load case matrix. Then, in terms of the wave scatter, is this is how I want this is how I want to estimate data for C sets which I haven't simulated explicitly. I create a new section called summary wave scatter. Uh, then I define the scatter diagram. I talk about the reference cells uh, and 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 the keyword files which actually simulate these reference cells explicitly. So here's HS. TZ and the percentage occurrence, followed by the name of the C the name of the FlexCon file which actually did that simulation for me. That's then followed by any further number of simulations. All of these ones have the same uh, TZ or upcrossing period, and these are the non-reference C states. So these are the ones it will estimate for. And then what that does is it creates a summary output data for all of these C states here, even though I didn't actually specify, uh, simulate them explicitly using FlexCon. And then I can, obviously I can go ahead and I can do a, a, a summary collation to collate values from all of these different values for all the different results from FlexCon. Let me just throw up more of these for you. Um, So let's look at say mooring line maximum tension in mooring line one. Uh, I've got a 3D plot generated here, but bearing in mind that I only simulated about 10 different C states, but I have results here for maybe 40 or 50 different C states in a in a in a 3D plot. So it's 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 a very very useful um, feature from from perspective of of solution efficiency. But as I said, it's purely for screening studies only. So don't don't do any engineering design with this this feature. Um, so, so this next feature, cloud licensing, is very much, um, it, it doesn't really affect the software itself from a user perspective, but it will or can of potentially affect how you purchase and license the software. So traditionally licenses in Flexcom have been called perpetual, which means you purchase the license and you have it forever, or rental, which means you have a rental for, for a certain period of time after which it expires. These are normally controlled by a dongle, which is like a physical device which you plug into your machine. It looks like a USB key. In the in this version of Flexcom and, and future versions, we're now offering uh, licensing as a service. So we have licensing on the cloud. So this means that you can access Flexcom anytime for your laptop or your computer, so long as you have an internet connection. You don't need a network server. You don't need a physical or virtual machine you know, in your office. Uh, set up by your IT personnel, which hosts the dongle physically. So this uh, licensing on the cloud is much easier from an IT perspective, and no doubt your IT personnel would be um, interested in hearing a little bit about this. Going on from that, we also have 
And because we now can host licenses on the cloud, it makes it very easy for us to turn on and off licenses very, very quickly, which you couldn't do with the old rental model. So with the old model, you might rent FlexCon for say three months. That means you, you turn it on day one and day 90, it turns off. What we can also offer nowadays as an alternative uh, licensing scheme is a token-based license model, which is very suitable for occasional use. So every time you run a simulation, it uses up a number of tokens and you buy a lot of tokens up front and it's like you have a bank, uh, like a credit, uh, it's almost like a prepaid credit card where you have all this token um, tokens available for use, which you subsequently pull from that pool of tokens as users gradually uh, perform the simulations. It's very, very useful for small companies who are companies who rarely use FlexCom and they don't really want it for certain periods of time. So if you're using FlexCom fairly regularly, then a purchase or a rental option is going to be more cost effective than this token based model. But if you're a small company or you've got somebody who wants to use the software very, very occasionally, it could be a very, very useful model as well. Uh, and if you need any further information on the costs or so on, um, just drop me an email and I'll, I'll be happy to provide more detail. We've popped in a few more examples in FlexCom. Uh, this one in particular is very, very useful. I think it, it, this, this example, A05, showcases a lot of good stuff in FlexCom. Um, it's a marine riser with a landing string model. So it's it's a pipe and pipe. Um, and it also illustrates how you can use these line section group parameters to um, model repeating line sections. Let me just see if I can open this one here for you. So it's help, example, projects, top tension riser. So it's A05, marine riser with landing string. Um, See if I can open up the model view. So it's a deep water uh, marine riser. But if I zoom zoom in closely, I said the LMRP and the BOP down at the bottom. Uh, I'll just turn on the thickness here just to maybe show you what's going on in a little bit more detail. So I'm exaggerating the thickness of these joints here just so you can see hopefully on screen. Um, but I'd have a flange at the bottom, then a bare section, then a long buoyant section, and then a flange and another. Um, uh, their section at the top so and then that section is just repeated right throughout the riser system so so the, the line section group command is very very useful for doing that I'll just search for a line so you may have seen this in in, a, in another presentation another tutorial but I basically define one of these riser joints in a lot of detail including the flange the bare and buoyant sections in as much detail as I want that's called the line section group with, with a specific name. And then for the from the line command, I reference that. I just repeat that line section group for as many as riser joints as I want. So it lets me build up the riser stack up very, very quickly. I've also used parameters and variations in terms of uh, deploying the uh, landing string within the marine riser. So you can have a look at uh, some of the parameters up here and it'll tell you uh, pretty much everything in this model is parameterized. It's a really, really good illustrative model of how to use FlexCam well and how to use it efficiently. Um, and as well as that, it also uses summary post-processing collation to look at, for example, upper and lower flex joint angles as a function of deployment of the landing string length right down through the marine riser and also as a function of the drill ship offset in terms of a lateral uh, horizontal offset of, of the drill ship as you're putting the so the marine riser down uh, the landing string sorry down through the marine riser so it's like a, a load case matrix of uh, static configurations of that particular structure it's a really nice example particularly if you're into drilling or top tension riser so it's a05 um, a couple of more just, just other minor points to cover before I, before I finish up um, pipe and pipe hydrodynamics we had a query in from a customer um last year which had noticed some numerical instability with a pipe and pipe model they were looking at and following some investigations we found out that uh, the treatment of the hydrodynamic inertia terms in terms of the flexcom solver internally wasn't actually being handled entirely correctly uh, we were actually basing these terms on uh other you know the accelerate the hydrodynamic inertia on the inner string was being based on the uh, acceleration of our velocity of the outer pipe 
at the previous time step when really it should have been fully integrated using an implicit solution technique and all of those terms should have gone on the left hand side of the uh, equations of motion. You don't really need to worry too much about the details there, it just means that the next version of Flexcom which you get on your desktops, version 8.10.1, um, if there were any, if you did see any issues in terms of pipe and pipe stability, these should be dramatically uh, reduced if not eliminated with this next version of Flexcom. So a few minor features which are very small but very, very useful. You may recall that in previous versions of Flexcom you had to start a particular simulation at the end time of the previous one. So if you did a static analysis followed by an offset, followed by a current, followed by a wave, it would usually start, the first one would start at zero seconds, the next one starts at one seconds, the current starts at two seconds, and the wave might start at three seconds or, or four seconds or whatever many number of steps you had in that process. In this version of Flexcom, all simulations can start at t equals zero, which is, it just makes things a lot, much, much neater. So even if you're doing a dynamic simulation, it doesn't matter how many statics you have in a restart chain beforehand, you can set start the start time at zero seconds. We've also allowed um, you users to post-process for local uh, vessel degrees of freedom. So you can, for example, look at vessel movements at the hang-off point using this time trace type equals vessel command. So in the old versions of Flexcom, you couldn't readily get out vessel, say, heave, roll, and pitch easily from Flexcom. You'd have to insert a rigid element from the vessel center of gravity to the hang-off point or whatever location you were interested in, and then you'd have to start looking at um, time histories of, of motions at that particular node in six degrees of freedom. And they weren't even necessarily, uh, particularly for the angular degrees of freedom, they might represent, um, they wouldn't necessarily represent Euler angles, they might represent um, the angular terms from Flexcom's initial internal solution scheme. So all of that is made much, much more simplified now where you can request for any point on the vessel, you can request time histories of heave, roll, heave, sort, sway, yaw, roll, and pitch, any of the local vessel degrees of freedom. Um, in terms of user experience, occasionally with Flexcom, you can get a disconnect between what's called the, the 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 execution engine in the background and the user interface and on the front end. If this little traffic light icon goes red, that means there's a problem. Or if, if you try to run a simulation and it didn't perform correctly here in the analysis status view, you might need to restart the Flexcom services. The problem with that in the previous version was that you needed administrator privileges to restart the services and many users wouldn't have admin rights in their own machines. That would be, they'd have to get the IT personnel involved. In this version of Flexcom, you don't need um, admin rights. You can just you know, restart or reset these services by right-clicking, and you don't need any particular permissions to do so. Um, we've also, in this version, we've introduced a new keyword, uh, or another extension of the wave general keyword, which means that you can put a user-defined origin for the wave field. So in previous versions of Flexcom, all the waves emanated from the origin. So y equals zero, z equals zero. All waves and wave phasing start from that point in space. In this next version of Flexcom 8.10, you can specify any point in the horizontal plane and set that for the, the wave origin to be equal to that, 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 that location. In terms of shear seven, commuting uh, VIV damage from Fatigue damage, sorry, due to VIV effects in Shear 7, we've uh, just updated our compatibility with the most recent versions of Shear 7 4.9 and 4.10. Finally, uh, just like to briefly mention that we've also, as well as doing what I would call mainstream Flexcom development, which is predominantly oil and gas driven, we've also been doing a little bit of work in the area of the renewable space. So we've developed um, one or two modules here called for wave energy converters and floating offshore wind turbines. So these are still, I guess, you know, maybe work in progress that we're building these capabilities up over time. Um, but we have already brought uh, two new modules to market, one of which is called Flexcom Wave, um, which you see on screen now at the moment. The other one is called Flexcom Wind, which I'll cover in a moment. Um, Flexcom Wave and Flexcom Wind, both of them can be accessed from the main Flexcom user interface by typing tools or pressing tools. Uh, model building, you've got Flexcom Wind and Flexcom Wave. Let's just look at the wave for a moment. This launches another module. 
um, which creates uh, it, it makes it life easy for the user in order to, to build these models very quickly. So this is Flexcom Wave. It's it's much more. Um, it looks very different to Flexcom. The model view is obviously identical because this is the same model view from Flexcom. But you won't see any keyword information here at all on screen. It's very much a UI type of front end. It's um, component based. So in order to model this device here on the right, I define a component for the spar, this lower structure. Define a component for the upper structure in yellow, that's the float. Uh, define other components for the mooring lines and so on. And I bring those all together in a, a master component, which is in this case it's called this uh, floating body dual point absorber. So you can see it's it's modular. It, one higher level component references lower level components. You can type in some dimensions and so on, uh, and select your your mooring line components. Then define your anchor points. Select your connection points to the floating structure and so on. So what this actually does when you press the run button is that it makes a, a Flexcom model in, in a keyword file. It'll just if I press this here. In terms of, it'll just open Flexcom for me. <coughs> Forgive me, I've I've been suffering a, a cough for the past number of days. My got a, a frog in my throat, so to speak. So when you press the run button with this Flexcom wave, it actually just um, creates Flexcom input files, which you may have actually seen one earlier on because I was showing that the uh, summary wave scatter feature. So it's very much. After this point onwards, it's just basically Flexcam itself. Uh, lots of parameters there, and maybe some lines for Let's search for mooring lines, so you can see how that's done. So I have a line for the upper and lower float, and then I'd have lines for the mooring lines. So why would we use Flexcom Wave, or why, why would you want to use it? Um, if you've never kind of worked with Flexcom before, it can be a little bit daunting. There's lots of new keywords to learn. Um, the, you know, there's a lot of upskilling involved to getting up to speed with Flexcom itself as a product. This Flexcom Wave, if you are a designer of a wave energy converter, it makes it very, very quick and very easy to build up these models. You can also, um, we've also interfaced Flexcom with another product called Exceedance Finance. So you can, um, type in your, you know, your username and your password, and you can log on to this other product called Exceedance, which is a financial appraisal software package which looks at uh, return on investments and levelized cost of energy and so on for these devices. But it also has an online database of sea states uh, or mid ocean data right around the world, so you can log on to the other package and you can import uh, sea state information uh, readily from um, online an online database. When you're finished uh, doing the simulation, you can actually go and look at simulation results. So it can present uh, what's called a power matrix in kilowatts. So in terms of how we model that in Flexcom, this particular structure, the float moves up and down on top of the, the spar. As it does so, it drives a linear power takeoff mechanism. We, we model this in Flexcom using a series of springs and damper elements. But ultimately, what we get out of it is a, a power matrix, which means that for particular sea state combinations, the damper or the PTO is being driven at a certain velocity with a certain resistance. This generates electricity. You can factor in some power losses due to uh, efficiency factors and so on, and you get a kilowatt rating for a particular sea state. And then when you plot this as a function of uh, all of the different sea states in the load case matrix, you can get a uh, what's called a 3D power matrix or a power a power map for that structure, which it really tells you if this device is suitable for deployment in a particular location, depending on what the ambient sea state conditions are and what the response characteristics of the structure are. So I don't really want to say too much more about it because I'm more, uh, conscious that many of you will be coming from an oil and gas background and maybe not that interested in renewables just yet. But in uh, in Europe, particularly Western Europe in particular, uh, wave and wind energy is becoming more and more more popular, more prevalent. So, uh, what is OptiWave then? Well, what I've spoken about there previously was called Flexcom Wave, which is just a module of Flexcom, as I've mentioned. In terms of branding this new new package, because we've coupled with this other company called Exceedance, uh, and their software is called Exceedance Finance, the, the 
the joining together, the combination of those two products we've called OptiWave, just to give it a unique brand name. So in Flexcom, we performed the technical, sim technical simulations and then on the exceeding side, they will perform the financial appraisals and come up with a return on investment for a particular um, operating CapEx, OpEx expenditure, um, feed-in tariffs and so on. So it's very much a financial appraisal product exceedance, which uh, dovetails with Flexcom to give uh, an end-to-end uh, service offering for any customers which are involved in this in this space and it's been I'll just note there obviously as well it's some of this software development was was partially funded by the SEAI which is the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland and we're, we're grateful for for the funding we, we received from from that body um, so I think we've covered all that we've published a couple of papers as well in a case study so if you are interested in if you are interested in renewable energy, wave energy in particular, just drop me an email and I can forward you on uh, links to the case study or the papers that we've published. And we've also got a, a sample video of this, this wave energy device. Uh, well, maybe I'll just throw that up on screen so you can you can have a quick look at that. So this is just a sample wave energy device. There's two bodies, one floating and one submerged. Um, and the upper body heaves and pitches and with respect to the, the lower body which is anchored to the to the seabed and as it does so it drives these power takeoff mechanisms so i'll just skip on through the video you can see that's what it looks like from a little bit further out and if i just zoom in a little bit on top you can see this is an arrangement of rigid elements and springs and dampers and this simulates the power takeoff mechanisms for this particular device okay i'll just uh, close that and i think finally i'll just talk about flexcon wind so Again, in a similar manner, similar manner to Flexcom Wave, just got tools, model building, Flexcom Wind. And this opens up a new module, which again makes it very, very easy to construct a model of a floating wind turbine. But you don't need to kind of worry about all the keywords in Flexcom. You have to just uh, go in and work in this, this new environment whereby you define the substructure, you define uh, the blades, you define the aerodynamic properties of the blades and so on, you define the mooring lines, um, all of this is defined using different components, so you won't see any keywords here. But obviously, as I said, as you, if you push the run button, it creates a Flexcom keyword file or a series of keyword files for, say, a static analysis and wave and wind simulations in time, to, time domain uh, simulation methodology, runs those and then presents the results back in uh, a format which is uh, readily acceptable to the user in terms of be there be a floating wind uh, turbine designer or so on. So here we're just looking at let's say some time histories. That's uh, aerodynamic power, uh, rotor speed. There's a series of these types of you know forces and so on, and then the, the the response characteristics of the of the floating substructure as well. So that's Flexcam wind, which would probably be of more interest to, to some of you certainly than because wind energy is more at a more advanced state than wave energy certainly globally. Um, so we're anxious that Flexcom can now uh, model these types of structures and compete with other packages which already exist in this uh, wind wind turbine space, so to speak. Let me just briefly flick back to my presentation. So how do we model that? Well, Flexcom, as you know, is a structural solver, and it's you know it's obviously got some hydrodynamic um, uh, modeling capabilities as well as we you know as I showed you we interface to Wamut and Ansys Aqua to extract results from those particular hydrodynamic modeling packages. What we've done here is we've actually coupled Flexcom to an aerodynamic solver, which is known as Aerodyne, or, or which is a sub-module of FAST. So FAST is a, a very, very popular tool in the wind in industry space. It's developed by NREL, which are the National Renewable Energy Laboratory uh, of the United States. And this is an open source tool. So by coupling Flexcom directly to this open source tool, we have all of the structural and hydrodynamic modeling aspects from Flexcom, and then we have the aerodynamic modeling aspects from FAST. And when the two are coupled together, um, then obviously the solution progresses in an iterative manner. Um, and we have done some validation based on international uh, benchmarking projects, one of them which is called OC4. I'll, I'll show you that in a moment. I'll just briefly throw up a video so you can see what what these structures looks like. Uh, so here we have it, it's a, a semi-sub, so there's three columns, um, pontoons and braces and so on, 
which support a single mast and on top of that we have it sits the wind turbine so that's how we model in flexcom um it's fairly self-explanatory you can watch that video online if you like and it can just show you how we we model the, the structure in flexcom wind and that transfers it to flexcom uh so that's pretty much it i think uh just to show you quickly if you wanted some more information on flexcom wind where would you get it just go to your flexcom um online help go to flexcom wind tells you about uh the various inputs and so on that it ex expects um and there's also a theory section which is interesting if you want to go into this level of detail you can see how the computational methodology it talks about the coupling between flexcom and fast and so on and all the various different components that are modeled in in the software moving on to look at control systems there's also an example as well so in flexcom uh, I'll go back to Flexcom here. So if I go to help uh, example projects, there's wind and wave energy projects here. So you just click on the wind energy project, it'll launch it for you. And I'll just show you some of the validation as well while I'm just on the space. So so it's examples uh, L for wind energy L1. This is the OC4, which is an international uh, benchmarking, benchmarking project. Uh, and we've taken the results which are publicly available and compare them to those of flexcom so we're comparing flexcom with fast here which is the the open source tool um looking at rotor speed torque um, blade pitch angle and, and generated power so this is power as a function of you know of time as we increase the wind speed you can see the power growing and you can see uh, fluctuations in power due to the regular wave loading there so the angle of incidence between the uh, the blades would say in the tower and the incident wind varies as the, as the structure p pitches slightly you know with with the uh the, the wave regular wave loading and so on so it's fairly specialized but if you need more information you can look at the online help or you can alternatively just uh, give us a call here at, at the technical support team so uh i hope that concludes i think that concludes the discussion on flexcom 8.10 i'll just maybe Go right to the top again if I can just show you the, some of the stuff we covered. So the metal plasticity feature, um, plastic deformation of residual strain in steel pipes, the user defined element, which lets you basically alter the properties of any element as a function of, of, of time within FlexCam while the simulation is progressing. The Unity plugin, which is purely a graphical uh, feature, which makes you allows you to use to, to, to create these very fancy videos and 3D VR virtual reality. Uh, representations of flexcom models hydrodynamic data importer allows you to import data from hydrodynamic simulators such as wamit or ansys aqua summary wave scatter feature allows you to uh, estimate results for c state combinations in a wave scatter diagram which you haven't explicitly simulated in the time domain cloud licensing just gives your it personnel more options uh, or your procurement personnel more options in terms of how you how you use flexcom how you how you license it from us a few new examples then we spoke about a lot of smaller features which contribute to enhanced user experience and finally we covered uh, renewables so floating wind turbines in particular of, of interest there so that concludes the presentation on flexcom 8.10 um, if you need further information on any of those features i suggest that you open your online help um, let me just do that for you And if you go to new features here, Flexcom 8.10, there's a list basically of everything I just covered, and there's hyperlinks to theory or examples which give you more information on all of these features. So Flexcom new features, Flexcom 8.10, you'll find everything that you need in there. Uh, for now, um, I, I leave it at that, and I thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to um, you joining me on further presentations on on Flexcom future versions are indeed on tutorial uh, packages on tutorial videos on, on certain elements of Flexcom. Thank you very much.